What's up, basketball coaches, players, and fans? Welcome to the Pass First Podcast, where we share our knowledge of the game of basketball. My name is Augie Johnston, and I'm here with my partner, Alex Angle. We have a special episode for you guys today, as we have a special guest uh, who we will reveal here in just a second. And we hope that you're able to take something away from this podcast that will help you in your basketball journey. Without further ado, let's go ahead and get into today's episode. All right, you guys, welcome back to the podcast. We have John Bynum here on the call today, and we are going to be talking a lot about trapping, okay? Trapping defenses, just philosophies, opinions on trapping. Uh, Just a quick background on John. Uh, He played overseas for 13 years. Is that correct? 13, yeah. 13 years, and um, has a really interesting story. His overseas story is super interesting because – He's a Division II player at a college and was actually able to have a super long career and not just in the bottom leagues, right? He's a, he's a first league player, although he played in many different leagues before. Um, and uh, wow, just a, a, a guy that when I was playing overseas, I would go and check on his Euro basket and see where he's at this year. And just a guy that I was like, wow, a D2 guy made it. And so uh, he was definitely someone that I was looking up to as, as I was playing out there. But um, currently... He is um, coaching as an assistant at uh, Metro State, where he played. Is that right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Very cool. And if you guys don't know, Metro State is, um, like I said, a Division II school, but a powerhouse uh, Division II school. Um, And I would like to just start this off by asking, what kind of team success did you guys have at Metro when you were there? Oh, well, while I played there way back in the day, uh, 98 through 2000, um, obviously I I came from California. I was a junior college transfer, so I was there for two years. And in two years that I played, um, played in two different, two national championships. Uh, Ended up losing my junior year to Kentucky Westland and then followed that up. uh, We ended up winning the championship my senior year. So a lot of winning. Said 61 and 10 in two years. And I mean, Metro's been known for a powerhouse for many years, but I was definitely blessed to, to step foot and, and go to school out in Denver, Colorado, for sure. Nice. Can you give us a rundown of the kind of uh, stats that you put up in, in high school, junior college, and uh, then at Metro, just real quick? Oh, absolutely. I mean, when I was in high school, um, it was more I played in a slowdown offense, so I played at Mount Whitney High School in Visalia. Uh, wasn't even an all-conference player. Um, probably averaged about 11 a game my senior year. Uh, I didn't even know if I was going to play basketball, college basketball. Wound up going to COS, College of Sequoias in Visalia. Uh, Ended up having a decent career. We had something, um, you know, we had a couple guys step down. Uh, Our head coach took a sabbatical, ended up scoring over 1,000 points in two years there. And then, like I said, we ended up going over to Metro State. Uh, third leading scorer for both years, uh, played with two All-Americans, and like I said, we had a lot of team success there, so that, you know, as long as we're winning the stats, it didn't really matter to me, so. Very nice. Man, another Cinderella story in a way. Uh, what we're finding is that pretty much everyone we talk to, we ask them about their numbers and stuff, and for the most part, a lot of people, there's at, at least one phase in their career, whether it's high school, junior college, or where they didn't put up the numbers. Like myself, I was not a big scorer in high school. Alex, kind of the same thing. Uh, sounds like you were in the same situation, but all these people that were interviewing, they did end up playing overseas or playing uh, at a high level D1. So it's just, it's, for me personally, like as a coach, high school coach, I'm looking at my players now like, okay, yeah, you might, you know, have a great college career because you might just continue to develop. And, you know, at this point, you're not there yet. And just it's just, I think, uh, motivational for people to hear. So, um, okay, let's go ahead and get into the topics for today, which is trapping. Uh, so if you were to have your own, let's just say high school program, um, or college program, whatever it is, would you trap? Would you have some kind of, uh, press or some kind of, uh, defense where you would trap? Um, absolutely. I, um, I'm all for pressure defense. I like, um, changing the tempo of, of the defense, you know, whether it's full court, half court. I mean, you just got to be ready at all aspects. And I mean, it's, it's tempo change. Tempo changes everything, in my personal opinion, and, and in my philosophies as well, too, the day where I will become a head coach for sure. Okay, cool. Alex, I just wanted to ask you two on the same. Would you, would you consider yourself more of a pressure, pressure on defense kind of coach or more of like, hey, stay home, contain, contain? 
Um, probably almost like a little bit of a mix, like maybe slightly pressure, slightly over on the pressure side. I don't, I don't want to just not allow the off the other team to, to kind of do whatever they want on offense. You know, I want, I'm okay with getting in the passing lanes. Like I do teach a deny, you know, if you're a pass away, deny the pass. Um, but I'm not like over aggressive, like, you know, let's lunge and, and try and get every steal because I think you leave yourself open to a lot of easy buckets on the other side. So. Okay. Yeah. I agree with that. Uh, John, back to you. So if you were to trap in the half court, okay, how would we most likely see you trap in the half court? Would it be like out of a man, a zone, a one, two, one? Like what would it be? Man wise, I don't think you can kind of incorporate it on, obviously, unless, you know, you're just getting kind of maybe in the corners, you know, but all that depends on if a guy's getting beat and where the rotations are coming from, obviously, but more in the zone set. Um, I'm a firm, I, I really like the one, three, one out of a half court set, you know, where you get the wings high and you make people play above the basket or make people play above the three point line. Um, you know, definitely in the corners or, or, you know, right in the half court area and just make people play as far as the bat far away from the basket as you can make them. You know, I really like that concept. Nice. Same question to you, Alex. How would we most likely see you trap if you're in the half court? I'm kind of in agreement. One, three, one. Um, I like that because like you said, it just keeps them away from the basket. And I've seen different variations with that where, um, you know, some teams will trap no, no matter where the ball goes. Like it goes into the corner on any four of the four of the corners and they'll trap. And then I've seen others where they don't trap until you throw it to that deep corner on either side the first time, you know, to kind of try and catch the defense by surprise. Um, I've seen one other one this year, but again, you know, it's high school. Um, so maybe it's, it's different. It might not translate as much to college, but I've seen the one, two, two, which sometimes uh, works in the half court. And I've seen teams run it really well, but I think, um, I think personally for me, the one, three, one is where I would go as well. Yeah, I, I agree with both that. I think it all depends on personnel, right? But uh, if you do have that, that lanky athletic quick guy, I think, you know, the one, three, one, putting him up top, or like you said, the one, two, two, I know a local high school here, Rio Grande, they run a one, two, two, that's pretty disruptive. And um, it's all dependent on that top guy, right? With those long arms and um, cool. For me personally, you'll see me trap out of the two, three. We like to trap short corners. We like to trap wings. Um, we played against a high school named St. Joe last year and they played man defense and they would just the first pass of the wing, they would trap that and rotate. And I think it's pretty high risk, but against us, it was, it was pretty effective uh, in the first half. So, um, all right. Next question is for John and John, uh, have you ever ran a junk defense like a box in one or a triangle two and on any team you've ever played on? I mean, we actually did something which was kind of crazy in high school at one point. We kind of ran an in, like an inadvert triangle where instead of putting, you know, we had two guys up at, you know, at the elbows and then we put the guy at the bottom. Hmm. You know, that was probably something that was really strange, but it kind of threw off the offense uh, in a lot of ways. But for the most part, I mean, if I was to do something, it would probably be more in the boxing one set to try and take somebody and, you know, out of the game or just out of their familiar territory that they're used to. Yeah. And as far as uh, just a follow-up question, when you did play overseas, if I remember correctly, you did start in uh, the Regina Liga. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Yeah. I started off in uh, Gravenbroich. Um, we were in the third league and we had actually a lot of success there. I ended up winning the league and moved up to the second league. So, Very yeah. cool. And so the follow-up question on that is when you were playing in that league, did you ever get boxing one against you? Yeah, it happened quite often. <laughs> you know, um, it, it was it's frustrating, you know, especially, you know, bringing, you know, as a point guard, if you pass that ball, then, I mean, most likely you're not going to see it and you're over there playing decoy for the most part, you know, but, um, you know, it, it, it's it's a good thing in a way because it does open up a lot of doors for your teammates to get a lot of open looks. But at the same time, you know, from a personal standpoint, it really does get frustrating that happens. I mean, you could probably vouch for that as well, too, because I know you saw him a lot, too, over there, probably. Yeah, the funny part about that, too, is uh, for those who don't know, when you're playing uh, in these lower leagues in, in Europe, they expect you to put up big numbers. And if you're getting boxing one, it's, it's not easy. And uh, the best thing for you to probably do at that point is pass the ball, but uh, it's a hard balance to find. Yeah, you so get it back a lot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, all right, uh, Alex, how about you? You ever ran or played in or uh, any of these junk defenses? 
Yeah, and uh, before I get on that, I was going to say one thing I think with the box and ones that makes it so hard for teams is especially if you have a guy that's averaging like 25, 30 points, and then all of a sudden you give the ball to your teammates, and even though they're like wide open shots or, you know what I mean, this floor is so much more space, they're so uncomfortable having that ball in their hands that much that it throws everything off, and I think that's why they're effective. Because if you think about it strategically, it really doesn't make sense. You're like, well, now I'm just playing four on four. I have way more spacing. It should be easier to score. But if you're not used to having the ball in your hands, I think it's just like a psychological thing. It throws you out. Um, but as far as, yeah, for myself, um, I have played in one when uh, when I was in junior college and when I coached there, we used to run what we would call a yo-yo defense. Um, and it was a 3-2 that morphed into a 2-3. So, you know, it, it's kind of a, I guess you throw it under that like junk defense thing. We would use it against teams that had a lot of size on us because basically that top guy would come, you know, when the ball would go to the corner, the top of the 3-2 would drop down to the post and front the post. So mm -hmm. if you if we were playing like a six nine six ten post and we only had six six, um, we would do that to try and keep the ball out of their hands. Um, obviously, you know the weaknesses are given the you're given more shots up in the corners, but that was one that we've used or I've used in the past, and it's been actually really effective. We've won games basically just using that defense almost the whole game because teams don't know whether to run a two three offense or a three two offense against it, and it's like it throws them all out. So yeah, the kind. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. I mean, the junk defenses, right, are, are really just to throw teams off, mix it up a little bit, maybe take out a player who's, uh, you know, highly effective. Um, I think the biggest question, though, that pops up and maybe one that you guys might want to think about is what do you run against the box and one, right? So um, I have my ideas because uh, I think we did get box and one last year, I think one, one time. And um, I remember at halftime trying to figure out what exactly we wanted to run. So I guess John, I'll throw this to you. If, if your team was getting boxed in one, what, what kind of offense would you want to run? From my standpoint, I just think you just run your normal stuff. You can't get too, you know, in depth. I mean, you're going to you just got to run what you know. I mean, if you're over there trying to change things up in the middle of the game, I mean, it's not going to work out well. I mean, you're just throwing new things at players. Just run what you know. If your guy's able to get open looks, I mean, your main guy I should say it, it's going to be positive but I mean you could always use decoys and and, and you know and kind of make things better for everybody else you know but I don't I wouldn't go off my normal stuff for sure yeah and just real quick to clarify what a box and one is for everybody that's listening I guess we should have talked about that it's just basically a mix between a zone and a man where one player is playing man defense on one player on the other team and then the rest of the players are in a zone in a 2-2 zone and for the most part, I think the 2-2 two, two zone has the same principles as like a 2-3. Um, Alex, how about you? What, what are you going to run against the box and one? Um, yeah, I kind of – I agree. I mean, I think there are probably offenses that work better than others. But, um, you know, you could run like a four-out one in and and try and, I guess, decoy that with that one to the side. And I guess it's more like a three-out one in at that point. And then you're just trying to attack the basket with like a motion. I mean, there's really a lot of stuff you can do, but – it's, it's kind of like what John said. You can't just do something that you've never worked on before because even though it seems different, like you said, it's really the same principles as a regular zone. You just have that one person off to the side. Um, so I think you got to try and stick with what you can as, as best as possible, but you want to definitely work something that spaces the floor, um, you know, whatever type of offense that is. You know, if you've got it where you're crowded and you got three or four guys on one side, you're kind of that you're going to mess up everything that's working with the box and one, because the more you can space those four guys out, there's only so much room they can really cover on the court. Yeah, definitely. My, my take on it is uh, one thing that I like to do against it is just a five out because it all said now you're kind of putting those, those zone players in a tough spot. And if you put the player that's being manned in the corner, then someone else is open because now you have that manned player in the corner being manned up. And also the bottom of the zone now is responsible for the corner too. So you got two players that are responsible for the same player at that time. So with that kind of spacing, just some quick ball reversals, that's what we did at halftime. We were just like, let's just run five out. You can cut, you can get high post catches. Um, and another thing too, I think that's effective is taking your, your player that's being manned up and have him be a screener. If he can screen the top side of the zone, um, it kind of can create some confusion, right? Because the guy who's guarding the, um, the man the man-to-man -man matchup, he uh, feels responsible, so he's not going to switch off him on a screen. So mm. I think these are things that need to be practiced at least sometime. I mean, as, as high school coaches, it's so hard because the practice time is so limited, and 
you know, to put in a whole nother offense to run against a box and one might just be a step backwards. So I do see definitely the value in just, Hey, just run your normal stuff, just run your normal stuff and, and make sure you set good screens and normal principles, you know, after you screen open to the ball, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I think that's kind of the way the, probably the best way to go about it. Um, okay, John, have you ever played like in a high, like high speed, high pace type, um, offense where you are expected to press every single time and push the ball every single time uh, down the court. Have you ever played in that? Oh, definitely. I mean, <clears throat> excuse me, while I was at Metro, I mean, that's what we were known for. I mean, that ball went through the net. I mean, we were picking up 94 feet. I mean, speaking of gimmick defense, I mean, follow Mike Dunlop, obviously, you know, we ran that one, one, three. So, I mean, that threw teams off. We do it three quarters court or we just, you know, go, go all out, you know, but from a defensive standpoint, you know, I, I play for you know a lot of programs where we just picked up 94 and just trying to turn people and once they turn somebody's you know running jumping or, or something um offensively you know I played in you know a lot of half courts situations and also you know where we just get up and down but you know with structure but you know if you're going to get up and down you, you got to have some sort of, sort of structure I mean I'm, I'm, you know, we're not, the, we're not blessed like James Harden and, and Russell Westbrook to where we could just ISO up at the top and then, you know, but, you know, for the most part, you just want to, you know, just push the ball and see what you got. And then, you know, just go from there. If you don't have anything, run something. You know, that's my whole belief in that. So you mentioned it's a, a one, one, three press, full court press. Yeah. So yeah, we, we ran a one, one, three. It was most, most of the time we run it like, you know, three quarters court. You know, if the ball comes in, you know, it's just, you know, if they throw it over to one wing, you know, that, that guy kind of goes over to that wing, you know, or kind of, you know, I'm kind of not making sense right now. But, you know, it's just it, – it's kind of like the, the two top guys are just replacing each other. If they threw it to the other side, the other guy's going and he's dropping. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So, for the most part, you know, we're just trying to take time off the shot clock. And then once we get to the half court set, uh, I mean, then we're – trying to just pin the ball on the on one side of the floor and, and just try and, you know, just take away the elbows and the short corners. Very nice. Cool. Uh, would you guys fall – well, I got one follow-up question. Would you guys fall back into, like, a specific zone or would you stay in the one one three in the half court? Yeah, we'd stay in the one one three in the half court as well too, you know. Wow. So, for the most part, I mean, as long as you pin in the ball on the sidelines, then, then I mean, you just had the guards – we were just responsible for just taking away that elbow. So once that pass goes to the wing, that the opposite guard who wasn't guarding anybody, they got the ball and the other guard has to get to that elbow. Ball comes back to the top, the other guard goes, the other guard drops to the elbow. So mm. we had principles, obviously, you know, just counting side, counting numbers on the sideline and so on. But you know, for the most part, the guards had to work the hardest. And <laughs> I know so if, if some big guys are almost from my team are watching that, they're going to disagree with me. But <laughs> You on your horse for sure. Yeah, I think that kind of reminds me a little bit of, of the two three that you run, Alex, or talk about a little bit as far as the guards, someone stopping the ball and stuff. So, all right, let's go ahead and keep moving on, guys. Um, now we're going to talk talk a little bit about trapping more on like a granular level, like a more micro level. So when it comes to trapping, I'm going to throw this one at you, Alex. Uh, like, where are you trying to get your traps? um definitely in the corners i mean are we talking like half court or full court or either one let's let's talk about full court now okay so full court um i mean to me one of the the best areas you can get them is i we call the coffin corner so right when they cross half court um because then obviously you can't go backwards i think that's probably if you think about it one of the best trapping spots in the, on the entire court um i do like the the depending on the press we're running the initial inbounds pass um, you know, if you can push them to catch near their own basket in the corner and you can trap there and get someone to take away back the inbounder, that's another good spot. That can be hard though. I think for teams, um, unless you, you have to really practice that one. I think, uh, you got to make sure that you've got someone that can get there every time and take away the inbounder. Cause if you forget to deny that pass back, it's easily broken. So, um, those are two areas I like. I mean, there's one other spot, I guess is on the other side of half court, like on the, on their side but they can retreat out of that. So I, I think um, it's effective, but I don't think it's quite as good as that initial pass or right across half court. 
Cool. I think, uh, John, you'd probably agree with the, with both that. So I don't need to ask that question again, but, um, was that, I said, absolutely. I'm yeah. Right on the head right there. Um, okay. So when it comes to trapping, is there any kind of specific technique? Okay. We're talking about two players coming to the ball to trap John. Is there any kind of specific technique that we're looking for or something that we might want to try to teach players? Um, you know, for the most part, you know, if you're taking away that sideline, just be sure that you have that foot on the sideline. Don't, don't get beat on that sideline side. Um, the guy coming over the trap, we used to always, you know, while I was at Metro, um, we just used to always cross feet, you know, just so they couldn't kind of, you know, split the trap or anything. You know, those were the two most common techniques that, uh, that come to my mind, you know, when it comes Very to Very nice. Yeah, so uh, just to kind of summarize, he said, make sure that that sideline guy gets his foot on the line to cut off that. And then also for the players to have their legs at least somewhat cross over each other so there's no split. Alex, you got anything you want to add to any more trapping technique? Um, just high hands, you know, either mirroring the ball or at least getting up to make to get deflections or make the passes hard. I think obviously, yeah, what, what John said about the, the foot part on the sideline, that's all 100%. You got to have that. And I think, yeah, it is, the more you can disrupt with your hands, the harder it's going to be for a team to pass out of it. Okay, nice. I, I agree with both of that. I think the, the only thing that maybe wasn't mentioned that I would add would be um, to not foul. You don't want to foul when you're in the trap. Uh, so that's kind of hard, I think, for players to to do because they want to get a jump ball. Like they want to reach in there and grab the ball because it's right there. But uh, I, I would advise not to do that because it's just not worth worth the risk. So, all right. Um, next question would be about like rules. So let's talk. Let's talk about pressing right now, or it could be a half court trap. But let's talk about pressing. So we're pressing. Is there any kind of rules that you would give your players? Um, any kind of like non-negotiables, if this happens, you must do this. John, is there anything you can think of there? I mean, two big ones come to my mind. Obviously, you don't want to send a trap when a, when a ball handler's, you know, square to, the, square to the whole court. So if he can see the trap coming, I mean, you're dealing with, you know, odd numbers. You're going to you're gonna be at a disadvantage. I mean, you're going to be catch, playing catch up on that sense. Um, and obviously, when a player turns, I mean, that that's a green light for me. I mean, if you see – you know, your guy struggling or, you know, a ball handler struggling and you get a beat and, you know, that's just every, that's means for everybody to just come up and, you know, try and make a play. Cool. So I think what he's talking about for our listeners, if they don't know, uh, are you referring to if a player was to turn and start dribbling in the opposite direction from you to flash? Yeah, when so, you... so how I mean that, so let's say the ball's thrown in. Um, I mean, let's say we're in a man um, and, you know, and, you know, the ball handler, you know, he's just dribbling to the right, and then obviously, you know, you turn him, you know, you, you got him, and, and basically you're just making him turn in the backcourt. So after that initial first turn, or if he's spinning with the basketball, you know, I, I just, I'm a firm believer, you know, just go after it. And that's going to lead the other defenders who are behind, you know, just to kind of move up and try and get a beat on the ball. Yeah, I like that um, because – I use that. We use a man press and that's an easy rule you can put in like, Hey, you know, we're not trapping everybody just pick up full. But if you do see somebody do a spin move away from you, that's green light. You can go. Or if you see a ball handler uh, get turned into the, and change the direction and you now see his back, he's going away from you. Bam, go get him trail trap right there. Um, Alex, same question. Do you any specific rules or things you try to tell your players? Um, no, I think those two are probably the main ones. I mean, I used to hear the same thing. If they're looking, if they're looking at you, you're probably going to be hard to trap. If their back's turned, it's going to be easier. Um, one other thing, I guess, just in pressing in general is make sure that you have someone back that can cover the basket, but that's not really, I mean, that's not the trap itself, but that's kind of to protect, that's the whole defense, right? But, um, you got to make sure you have always, someone knows who's rotating depending on what press you're running to cover the rim. Cause if you have no rim coverage and it's just easy layups. Yeah, and something that we haven't really talked about a lot is anticipation, right? There's got to be some level of anticipation in the, the press. And uh, what I tell my players is to read the eyes, like read the eyes, look at the eyes, because that can really tell you everything, I think, in the press as far as, you know, where am I rotating? Because when you're pressing, a lot of times you're kind of, if you're not on the ball, you're in between two players, right? You're kind of like, I got this guy and then this guy over here. I'm kind of in between. I'm trying to make a read. So I tell my players, you know, read the eyes. If they're looking down the sideline, then you go hustle back and take away the middle, right? Because they're not, they're not looking backwards. But if they turn and pivot and now they're, you know, on the other side of the trap, looking out, I'll say the other side of the, the double team, then you got to get, 
get to that other side. Um, and I think that works well. All right. Uh, let's talk about different presses. Okay, so we already talked about the 113. So I'm gonna go with John first. If you were all of a sudden to get hired tomorrow to be the varsity coach of a high school program, and you're like, all right, we're gonna put in some kind of press. What kind of press are you putting in? And uh, I'll have some follow up questions to that. Yeah, uh, I like the one two, one two two or one two one one. Um, you know, I like having a man on the ball. Um, just you know, if you get a beat for that first trap, then go. If not, then I mean, then just lay back and you know, however, however you want to do it, or you know, or if that ball comes in, you get to force it on one side, and you know, just it all depends. You know, whether if you if you run it hot. You know, when I say hot, I mean, you know, if you're just trying to, you know, just get a get a quick steal and, and put a lot of pressure on or, you know, I also like time consuming presses as well, too, you know, to where it's, you're not so, you know, you're not so aggressive with it. But at the same time, I, I love a change in tempo and game. You know, that's that's the main thing with me. You know, that's that'd be one of the things that I would really try and, you know, instill in my program is just changing the pace of the game all the time. Nice. Yeah, the the one two two is definitely a press that Alex and I ran for a year or two with our AAU program, and I like that press too because, you like you said, you can run it kind of differently. You can run it hot, where when that first pass comes in, the other guy's denying the pass back to the inbounder, and everyone's rotating, or you can run it more conservative, where that first pass goes in, everyone's trapping, and instead of taking the pass back, you take away the middle make them throw that pass back and then you can rotate out of that into another trap but um Alex I want to throw the same question at you I already know the answer but uh what would you run if you were going to run a press uh so I used to say the one two two all the time but I've kind of changed a little bit more to the two two one um I do I do teach both to my team right now my girls know how to run both of them but I've had more success with two two one at least at the high school level um because one, it's to me a little more conservative. And as you can tell, like with my response earlier to defense, I'm not like a super gambling type of coach right now, as of now. Um, so it's a little more conservative, but you can still disrupt. Um, I think the 2 2 1 is maybe used more often as a time consumer um, compared to the 1 2 2, which is used a little more to get steals. So I like that. I like, like you said, I like to eat up some time and then make the defense make or make the offense make mistakes. Um, mm. And, and then it's a little easier for me to fall back into defense if they break it um, from, you know, for what I've experienced. But, uh, and I think what the point you made was good that a lot of people think of presses as just like, oh, we're just trying to get a steal every time. And they don't realize that a lot of teams run it to just be disruptive and to slow things down. So that by the time you get across and you're in your offense or trying to get in your offense, maybe there's only like 15 seconds left on the clock. And so you only get one set or one look um, before you got to kind of jack a shot up, you know? So I think that's uh, – people forget about that. They think pressing is just like, let's steal and let's get as many turnovers as possible. And it's not always about that. Let me ask you guys this, you know, just play devil's advocate. Do you drop back in the zone or do you drop back in the man for the most part? I go into man um, usually. I, I'm not a huge fan of zone defenses in the half court. Uh, I'll run it against specific teams, but generally I like running it back into a man. So I just teach my players to – if they have to find someone near and rotate, but if they can find who, you know, find who they were supposed to guard ideally. Yeah. And I, I would just add to that. I'm the same way. I like to fall back into a man off any kind of press, but um, I know that it's very common. And I've even had, you know, some parents tell me like, you can't press in a two, two, one and go back into man. You have to go back into zone. And I've heard that before, but it's, it's not true. And in my opinion, it's harder to get back into a two, three than it is into a man, because when you're pressing, you don't know where you are. All of a sudden you, you're sprinting back. They break it. You're just, you just match up, right? You just match up with somebody instead of like, Oh, I'm playing the bottom of the zone. I have to get all the way to the bottom. And now someone's already there. And there's just like more miscommunication. How about you, John? I agree. 100%. I mean, you almost got to just match up to whoever's closest and then just play the play of cards with that, you know, and, just match up and do the best you can. There's going to yeah. be cross matchups. Yeah, definitely. There's, if you're going to press, then be ready. There's going to be cross matchups. But um, I've I've never been one to be worried about cross matchups. We switch ball screens. We we do a lot of that kind of stuff just because it's high school. 
it's high school and a lot of times you're playing against a team that doesn't even have a post player or uh, a peer point guard or anything like that. But um, just to kind of close out the last question about um, pressing and stuff, you guys both mentioned time, right? Presses can eat up time. And Alex, you mentioned that the other team might just throw it away. So I think that's kind of an interesting thing to think about. Can you get your team to press for the entire game in a 2-2-1 or whatever it is and be very conservative, not even try to trap, and just keep, keep them in front, you eat up clock. And what's that gonna look like at the end of the game? How many turnovers are gonna come from that? How many shot clock violations are gonna come from that over the course of a full game? And I, be, I mean, just to throw a number out there, you're gonna get three turnovers off the other team just throwing it away. You know, especially, it depends on what level you're at. But um, like maybe not college, but in, in high school, they're gonna throw it away for sure. And then uh, as far as the, the shot clock goes, yeah, it, it helps, but, uh, one thing that I always wondered was in Europe with a 24 second shot clock, it seems like everybody should be running some sort of at least pick up full, turn your guy, turn your guy, something to eat up clock because boy, John, you know, that shot clock is quick. Yeah, it is. I mean, and the crazy thing is, is I never did really encounter that much press, especially like when I got towards the BBL level. I mean, you, you see one guy pick up, but I mean, it wasn't, it was just seemed like it was just false advertisement pressure. And I mean, just letting people get into your sets and so on. So, but yeah, I mean, for the most part, I, I'm in agreement. I mean, man, there's going to be turnovers. If you press, if you speed people up, they're, they're going to make mistakes. Yeah, definitely. And uh, John just mentioned something about the BBL. So if you guys don't know, that's the, the top league in Germany. And what, what teams did you play for in the BBL? Uh, I played for Bremerhaven, Paderborn. I think there's one more. Trier. And then yeah, those were the only three I played for. Very yeah. cool, man. That's must have been a great feeling signing that contract, especially coming from a D2 and working your way up. Oh, man, it, it was crazy, you know, especially, you know, playing against guys who you, I mean, you're seeing on TV while you're playing in Division Two basketball and then you're on the court with them. So that was an awesome experience for sure. And, and as far as, uh, not to get too far off topic, but last question on this is, like, how did you end up getting to that BBL level? What, did your team get promoted or did you have a crazy year with some statistically one year or what? So my, I was playing in the second league and then uh, we played against a team that moved up, um, which was Bremerhaven at the time. And um, I had two big games against Bremerhaven. And the following year after I left playing the second league, I ended up signing in Cyprus and I ended up being, that was the first time I got released in my career. Uh, but midway through the season, uh, they had the same coaching staff and uh, they needed a player to just come in, kind of be a backup. And uh, that's how I got my foot in the door was just the coach remembered me from having a big game against them in the second league. So. Very cool. Nice. Yeah, it's interesting to, to see everyone's journey as far as moving up and stuff is always different. All right. Um, let's let's talk a little bit about half court traps. OK, so. Um, we already talked about the one, three, one. So in the one, three, one, where, where I'll let you start with this, Alex, if you're going to trap in the one, three, one, where are you trying to trap and, and what are you trying to get? Um, I think I mentioned it a little bit earlier that I, I like the, the bottom corners the most, um, you know, get them to throw the ball down into the, into the deep corners. Um, I don't, I don't necessarily hate the half court, you know, the, the trap near to half court in those corners as well, but I think it depends on personnel a lot. Um, you talked about that you have to have a kind of like a lanky or athletic player at the top, right, to be able to disrupt the ball. But I think something that people forget about too is the person playing the bottom hole, the bottom of the one three one, has to be quick too because they've got to be able to get out to the corners. So if you've got someone athletic and lanky up top, but then your bottom person is not that quick, then when the ball goes to the corner, it's gonna, they're gonna either going to get split or the ball's going to get tossed out. So um, – usually my two two quickest players are, you know, top and, and then bottom. And then the three in the middle, you're going to kind of work with. I usually probably am going to put my slowest player directly in the middle of the one three one mm -hmm. um, because they have the least movement. Usually they're covering basket when the ball goes to the corner or they're covering high posts or something like that. So definitely corners, you know, you're trying to force the other team to throw it to one corner or the other, and you cannot give up middle. If the ball gets to the middle of the one three one, it's over. You're dead. Okay. Uh, same question to you, John. Um, if you are trapping in the half court, I guess you said you'd like to run a one, three, one as well. 
So maybe this question is probably going to be the same answer, but just can you give me any more insight into the one three one? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I totally agree. I mean, I like you, you could change the aggression level on it as well, too. You know, um, you could bring those wings up really high and trap right when they cross half court, you know, and sometimes, you know, obviously the corners is where you want it. Um, you know, I like putting my point guard down at the bottom as well, too, you know, and keeping that big man, keeping the center right in the middle. I mean, just to come down and cover that area just to help out with rebounding as well, too. So, you know, those are, those are two things that I'd probably add to it, but I'm, I'm in agreement with everything that Alex said for sure. Nice. And one thing I was going to add to that, I, I had to deal with that, you know, with the high school level with the girls and you guys may not have to uh, on the boys side as much, but at first, like when teams would run presses against us, like, like how you talked about where they would come up high at a half court and trap right, right when you came over, what was so effective about it is a lot of the girls and I, I'm talking about just in general, they cannot make the cross court pass from one side to the other on like an accurate level. And I don't know if it's just a strength issue or just a practicing issue, but a lot of my players couldn't make it. And like a lot of other teams I would watch, they, you know, that cross court pass where normally on the guy's side, it would just be boom, quick fire it over layup. They really couldn't do it. And I finally found like one, two players on my team that could just fire it over. And once we figured that out, I would, every time a team trapped us, I'd put that player up in the top top left, pass it over to her. Oh, here they come. Just fire right over layups, layups, layup, you know? <laughs> um, so that's something that at least for me, I've had to think about recently. And I think on the guy's side, it might be just a size and strength thing, or maybe it's just a practice thing, but it's a little bit different. Yeah. Very cool. All right. For me personally, I'll uh, play a little bit of devil's advocate here and, and talk about a different half court uh, trap. Um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, let's just talk about man trap. So what we'll do sometimes is we will trap the first pass out of it, like we talked about earlier a little bit. So imagine point guard comes down, they throw it to the wing, the guy who's guarding the point guard sprints over and traps on that wing. So what this does is it causes there needs to be two other rotations that happen. The other weak side wing has got to rotate up onto the point guard who is now wide open. And then the second rotation would be the the baseline guy if let's just say they're like in a three out two in for example would be that baseline guy guarding the weak side block and he would then have two players right he'd have two to guard he'd have that weak side block and that weak side wing and so like we said earlier in most traps you know you're always going to you know be playing in between two players so that'd be him playing in between those two players obviously shading the rim to protect the direct pass to the rim but that skip pass over the top to the wing he can go and get that and if that skip pass does go, he can rotate on that. And it's real easy for all the other players to rotate in the other direction, right? Two more rotations. So um, that's kind of the, the trap that we like to run sometimes. I mean, we have it put in. It's not like we run it a ton. But um, with, I, like the man, I like the man traps too because uh, there's just more accountability. Like on the rotation, I can say, hey, you know, you, you were the closest guy to there. You need to rotate onto that. But for whatever reason, it's just not easy for players to get. I don't know if it's because they're so far away from the ball when the ball gets that first pass to the wing that they just don't rotate up high enough or quick enough. They don't anticipate. But I think if you can get a team in a man press or a man defense that can trap and stuff and, and rotate, then you're going to have a pretty good defense because that's all defense really is, right? Help, you know, kick out, rotate. But it just seems like it's something you have to practice a lot. And um, I'm hoping that this year that we get to do a lot more man press, man trapping, and that kind of stuff with the team that we have. So we're going to be playing small ball this year. So th that's kind of why I was interested in talking a little bit about trapping because we're going to have to be disruptive. I mean, we could even go five point guards, like literally. Alex knows the team. He, like We could yeah. literally put five point guards on the court. Like, like not just players that play point guard, but like peer point guards, <laughs> which is crazy to say. But um, that's just the class. That's high school basketball, right? We don't recruit them. We just get them. Absolutely. You got to make, make the best of what you're dealt with, for sure. Yeah. And, I mean, the thing about it is they're just all great players, too. So um, that's the cool part. So, all right, we're going to go ahead and close this out here in a few minutes. But I want to do some rapid-fire questions. Um, and we will just go with you, John. So just uh, a short sentence or two on each of these would be good enough. So – uh, if you need any time to think about one, then go ahead, because these are going to be random. But the first one is, what is your favorite man offense? And if you could go into a little bit of detail here. Oh, man. I I like one-four sets. 
Um, just, I like stuff out of horns. I like, you know, there's just different variations that you could run out of, you know, out of one four, you know, so I'm a big one four high believer. Nice. I actually really like that set too, or that spacing and stuff, but um, we don't actually run a lot of that stuff, but we play against teams that do. And I like it. Can you give us like an example maybe of like one set or entry or one kind of continuity offense you'd run out of that? Um, I mean, but for the most part, you know, just real basic, um, you know, let's just say we're going to run horns real quick. You know, if you go off the four, obviously you want your four to pop, go off the five, you want them to roll. Um, ball goes back, throw it through the wing, um, double screen away, guy comes up right into a ball screen. And I mean, you're just playing off of that really. So I don't know if that made any sense for the, for the viewers or anything, but you know, um, yeah, it's just real. I, I think it's a pretty simple concept. You know, that's just one of the sets that I would run, you know, for sure. You know, very nice engine, a ball screen for sure. Cool. So horns, horns, offense, um, Alex, you run any horn stuff? Yeah, actually I do. Um, not a ton, but we do run some stuff against it, uh, or you're using that. And it's kind of similar, uh, where if you come off one, and I, I do it more where if you come off one, then that one might roll and the other one might pop. And that's, I don't know if, I don't always say like the four has to do this or the five has to do that. Unless of course my five can't shoot at all, then I'm probably going to have them go into the basket every time. Um, but yeah, pretty similar to what John just talked about. We, we run stuff like that. Cool. And just for our, listeners and viewers if you don't know what we're talking about we're talking about the point guard with the ball up top two players at about the elbow maybe a little bit higher and then uh, two players on the wings now as soon as you come off that ball screen the wing players are dropped to the corner obviously to get more space but um and then just using a pick and roll on one of those sides and roller hit the roller hit the kick it back for the pop out or other variations that um john and alex just mentioned too but that's kind of the basic behind that and one thing that i love in uh I learned this from our JV coach last year and it looked really good when they ran. I think we're going to start looking at it is uh, running this stuff against zone, uh, like a one, four set against zone. Cause if you're going against a two, three and you got a one, four set, I mean, you got two guys guarding four or really two guys guarding five, right? If the point guard has the ball. So I, there's a lot of cool uh, set, sets. There's quick hitter sets really that you can run out of that. Like for example, uh, if I dish it, it's a simple one is if I dish it to the guy at the elbow and then the opposite big on the elbow just dives down, his goal would be to uh, seal, seal the outside guy and they can just go high low right there. If the outside guy drops down, then you just kick it out to the shooter right there in the corner. So super simple, quick hitter, but um, one that can create you a shot almost every time. Um, okay. Next rapid fire question is defense. So you just got the job. You know you're going to be running some defense next year. What kind of half-court defense are you running? I like man. You know, I'll keep it short and sweet there. I'm, I'm, I'm a firm believer in man. Take accountability. You know, Don't get beat. <laughs> it's funny. I think, um, I think everyone nowadays says man because there's like this stigma about zone, right? So don't be afraid to say zone if you want to, <laughs> if you, if you want to play at Syracuse as a kid. And... Uh, I, don't, I, don't want, I don't want any part of that, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. Like, it, it really is a thing, though, that like coaches now are like starting to say, like, I don't play zone, I don't play zone. And I think that's good, right? Especially at the youth level and stuff, too. But I mean, like for me personally, like I don't play zone either. But like, yeah, if we're playing a team where we can't match up, we're playing zone the whole game. Like, <laughs> absolutely. Nobody can shoot, too. I mean, we're not blessed with Syracuse as athletes. So, true. Okay. So uh, let's talk a little bit about man defense then. Uh, are you a deny the wing, deny one pass away, or are you more plug it up, get in the gaps? Uh, I like denying. You know, if you get beat back door, so what? You know, we got help there. You know, I want, I like keeping the ball on one side of the floor as well, too. Um, you're a pressure the ball. I want to speed, speed up a guy, you know, make him make a play off the, off the dribble. Not a lot of people can play off the dribble and make passes off the dribble. So I'm guessing that you are a forced baseline guy, too. Is that right? Forced baseline, for sure. You know, I don't want anybody seeing the middle of the floor. You got too many options if you get to the middle of the floor, in my personal opinion. Nice. Okay. Um, what about, so... In coaching nowadays and with analytics and everything, everyone always talks about the mid-range jumper uh, as being not a good shot because of just analytically, you know, whatever. Uh, what's your opinion on that? Do you think, do you disagree with that or do you agree with that? I disagree. I'm a firm believer in the mid-range. I mean, you get whatever 
take the best shot, whatever it's worth. If you can make a two mid range at 55% and you're shooting threes from 35, man, you better not step behind that three point line. <laughs> That's fine. I mean, I made a living off of mid range for my career. So if it's a missing trade in today's game. You know, everybody wants threes or layups. I mean, and you get a mid range shot and you do it very well, then you better shoot that damn shot. <laughs> it's, That's, it's, it's interesting that like so many you know we, we've had a lot pretty much everyone we've had on I think actually literally everyone we've had on was a player at some point so even if they're coaching now they played at some point you know either in college or professionally I don't think one person that we've talked to has said oh no I don't like the mid-range you know what I mean? Like not one player that we've talked to is like, oh, that's a terrible shot. But if you talk to, you know, like you said, analytics, there are a lot of coaches nowadays that are just like, oh, it's a bad shot. You shouldn't shoot it at all. So uh, it's just interesting. It's hard to, as a coach, I think, or it's not hard as a coach, but it's hard as a player. If you have to play in these black and white, you know, yes or no type scenarios where like, hey, no, you literally cannot shoot a mid-range jumper. You're coming out. Or like something that I'm learning, like on our team, you literally cannot let a player drive middle or you might come out. Like there, there needs to be some sort of balance because, like you said, we're all players here and we know what it's like to play. And when your coach tells you you can't let them go middle, well, then you're getting beat baseline every time. You know, <laughs> yeah. like you're just like – it's like you can't D up like that. Although, um, you know, coaches do it for reasons too, right? You, you put that, that strict rule, no middle, and then, yeah, you do get beat baseline every now and then. But um, you can live with that, I guess, as a coach. But, um, okay, last question. Um, if you're going to press, I think we probably already talked about this a little bit, but what kind of, like, are you going to be a zone press or a man press? I think it's a mixture of both. You know, I, I really like, I like zone presses, you know, just cause uh, there's a kind of a, a, you know, a gray area when the trap a lot, a lot of times on, on man presses sometimes, you know, but you know, as long as you have those distinctive rules within your team scheme and everything, then, you kind of get away with it, but I like zone presses a little bit more than man presses. Okay, cool. Very nice. And yeah, I mean, I always have this big idea every year that I want to be this man pressing team, but it's, it's hard when it comes down to it. A lot of times we uh, do just fall back into the zone press because I think it's easier to set up and, you know, this year we're going to try to mix it up, you know, man zone, man zone, all these kind of stuff, because like I said, we're small trying to keep everybody on their toes. Um, all right. Well, I think, we talked a lot about defense and trapping, which is good. Kind of last question, as a player, did you consider yourself a defensive player, an offensive player, or more of a mix of both? I think defense is where I found my niche and where I was able to hang around the BBL. Um, I accepted that role. Um, you know, when I was early in my career, obviously at Sequoias, I was more of a scorer. But, you know, as I got older, you know, I knew that if I took – you know, defensively or defense more seriously, then I'd probably have more of a chance of being on the court. Cool. All right. Uh, Alex, you got anything else that you would like to add? Um, no, I mean, I just, I think for those of you listening, like I want to make sure they, they understand and appreciate the fact that like, to me, I think one of the coolest things, you know, as far as winning, playing professionally and all that uh, about your career, one of the coolest things to me is winning a national championship. And I, I kind of wanted to go on, say on that earlier, but like, you know, there are only, well, I don't know, however many divisions there are in college, six or seven divisions. So only six or seven teams each year win a national championship. And I don't care what level you are, whether it's division one, division two, division three, like that's really, really hard to do. Um, so, you know, for those of you listening in, like you've accomplished a lot as an individual overseas and then also on a team level. So I hope you guys like take what he's saying and understand that he's been at every level. The BBL is also one of the top leagues in the world, um, you know, so so that's, that's just really cool to me. Like, and I'm sure you got the championship ring. I'd be wearing that thing every single day if it was me. So. <laughs> yeah. Now, if it looked like everybody's today, I, I might, but man, <laughs> it, it looks very small to today's people. Man, so I'm kind of scared to break it out nowadays. <laughs> they gave you the one out of a gumball machine instead of the actual. <laughs> it looks like compared to today's ring. So for sure. But, uh, yeah. I appreciate you guys having me on, you know, you guys are doing a good thing and, you know, I, I keep up and, you know, I, I watch these as well too. And man, just keep spreading knowledge like you guys are doing, you know, it, it's a great thing for sure. Thanks. Appreciate man. that. All right, you guys, that's all we got for this week. Thank you so much for watching or listening. If you like today's episode and are watching on YouTube, make sure to hit like and subscribe. If you're listening on iTunes, make sure to hit subscribe as well. We come out with a new episode once a week, and we hope to see you guys in the next one. Peace.